So on behalf of the organizing committee, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our speakers for today. Our first speaker is Dr. Hilmar Strickfaden. Uh, Dr. Strickfaden completed his undergraduate degrees at the University of Freiburg in 2003, and then obtained his doctoral degree in 2010 from the LMU uh, Munich under the supervision of Dr. Thomas Kremer. He then joined Dr. Michael Hensel's lab at the University of Alberta as a postdoctoral fellow and is now currently continuing to work there as a research associate. So with that, um, I'll hand you, Hilmar, the uh, virtual microphone okay. and, uh, to us for you to give us uh, your talk on KMT5C in liquid heterochromatin microenvironments. Okay, thank you for the kind introduction. So today I'm going to tell you something about liquid heterochromatin microenvironments and I will focus on a methyl transferase called, called uh, KMT5C. And all this work that I'm presenting you was conducted in Dr. Alan Underhill's lab and he's also leading this project. So if you are in cell biology and you haven't lived under rock, you know what liquid, liquid phase separation is. Just in a nutshell, you have some uh, some components that under thermodynamically favorable positions can uh, unmix. And the, there are some uh, polymers involved in this, usually RNA proteins, and in some cases DNA, but Mike will get into detail with this later. So that, uh, have, that can have certain domains that can make non-specific multivalent interactions and can lead to this process. So this process, of course, can be done in vivo. But what is more interesting for us is when we look at how, where it's happening in the cell, and it can happen in the cytoplasm. But today, we're exclusively in both talks focusing on the, on the um, nucleus. And uh, whenever I looked at uh, fluorescence pictures of nuclear bodies, I was always fascinated by the ability to uh, concentrate uh, high amount of uh, similar proteins into a compartment and recently has been found that some of these nuclear bodies, uh, they are indeed uh, uh, forming by phase separation or their principles in there, but not all are doing this. So I don't, we don't think that uh, splicing speckles do this too much. But um, what I want to tell you today is the phase separation of proteins in uh, an area that is uh, that is a pericentric heterochromatin. So in some species like mice, you will get uh, chromocenters and chromocenters are clusters of, um, of pericentric heterochromatin that resides on the close to the chromocenters in these mouse chromosomes. And because of their, their certain shape that they're all telocentric, so they're clustering to these bodies. And these bodies, uh, these uh, chromatin um, areas, uh, they can harbor a specific set of proteins. And some of them have recently been rumored to do phase separation. So some of these heterochromatins that localize to the pericentric heterochromatin and that are rumored to do phase separations are KMT5C, uh, MECP2, and CPX5, which is also known as HP1. I will, we will compare them later, but I will mainly focus on KMT5C. So what is KMT5C? So it's a methyl transferase that is uh, predominantly used for uh, three methylation of H4K20. In the Drosophila world, it's, world, it's called uh, Zuva420H2. And so to um, trimethylate H4K20, it needs uh, another epigenetic modification, methylated H3K9. To do this, it binds to other proteins like HP1 alpha, which is also called CBX5, and other chromobox proteins and other proteins. So H4K20 is usually an epigenetic marker that is associated with silencing and repression of genes of uh, transposons and repetitive elements. And it is often uh, the case that uh, it's associated with uh, cancer, when, especially when it's in combination with uh, reduction of H4K16 when the acetylated form of this. And um, now to the fun part, a couple of years ago, our excellent tech, Crystal, she was performing some experiments on mouse cells that were transfected with KMT5C. 
and uh, she made a very interesting discovery. So when she was um, partially bleaching from a center, which will, you will see in the upper circle in this movie, she could see uh, some kind of reflux, a liquid like, like a viscous behavior of fluorescence uh, recovery. While as when she was completely uh, photo bleaching it from a center, it stayed, uh, it stayed dark or in this case, uh, brighter uh, for many, many minutes. And you can see this in the, uh, the graphs below. You can see that when you're totally bleaching a chroma center, the recovery takes a long, long time. While when you're partially bleaching it, there's kind of a mixing within this compartment. So that suggests that KMT5C is adopted a viscous-like uh, environment and that, uh, that uh, has a significant uh, energy barrier that prevents the uh, protein to exit this. So we did something else we're calling it inverse FRAP, so where we have uh, photo bleach every, uh, everything but one uh, chroma center, and then we have waited for the proteins uh, that were not bleached in this chroma center to go to other uh, chroma centers over time. And as you can see, it takes a long, long time that you, before you see, even see something, even if you enhance the contrast there. So we were wondering what, uh, so then uh, when you compare this in contrast to other proteins like MECP2 or CBX5, you see that they don't have this behavior. So when you're totally bleaching these chromocenters uh, uh, with the, the proteins in these chromocenters, so they reappear after couple of seconds, especially fast as CBX5. And if you're only partially bleaching this, you don't really see this reflux effect because it is uh, superimposed by the fast recovery to these sites from outside. So we were wondering what is responsible for this phenomenon. And so we tried to dissect this protein that has a set domain, of course, for the methylation. It also contains the RNA binding domain. And what uh, we have figured out that it has a domain that we call the chromatin retention domain that is only about a tenth of the whole protein, about uh, 57 amino acids. And uh, interestingly, this part of the protein was responsible for the complete dynamic behavior we have observed with the full length protein. So we were curious and because there was this RNA uh, binding domain and uh, we have uh, we have done these uh, dynamic experiments, but we didn't see a difference. Then we have um, tethered it to a LAC array with a LAC pressure that is fused to it and have uh, transfected it to the same cells, another CRD with another fluorescent protein attached. And we could see that they are, uh, are co-localizing then. So they are binding each other. That was interesting. So. Then we looked at ortholog uh, proteins from other species, and although there were some slight differences, uh, but they uh, overall um, they were very similar. They have recruited to the chromocenters, and they have showed this weird dynamic phenomenon. So we have aligned the protein sequences, and then we didn't see that the homology was very, very uh, high. We also looked for a disorder because these uh, intrinsically disordered parts of proteins, they are contributing often to these kind of phase separation effects. But we could at least see two parts, so some subdomains of this uh, chromatin retention domain that showed increased homology. And when we then uh, mutated uh, some of these amino acids, we could see that the, the properties, the dynamic properties, they have changed significantly. So they uh, mimicked more the ones of uh, CBX5. And uh, other things have happened too, which were interested because we could see that the kind of amount of uh, nucleoplasmic uh, protein compared to the uh, protein that was in the chromocenters was reduced uh, when the retention properties were decreased. And also the chromocenters, they were more amorphous so that we could see that the retention strength correlated to the what we're calling the petition coefficient, the kind of contrast here, the amount that is inside the uh, chromocenter and the nucleoplasm, and then the shape which was interesting. The past couple of uh, months, uh, we were focusing on the evolutionary um, path of this uh, chromatin retention domain. And we could see that uh, it occurs in all the tetrapods. But interestingly, if you're looking at the evolutionary clock, this linker region seems to get shorter and shorter, while these other two subdomains, they are more or less similar. 
So with this, I want to summarize because it's a short talk. So that KMT5C exhibits a novel dynamic state characterized by liquid-like behavior, but limited exchange. So this could restrict this protein to this and could affect the uh, restrict the catalysis of uh, H4K20. Then uh, there are different proteins that are doing phase separation in chromocenters, and they are very uh, have a, a very different dynamic properties. So this could probably uh, control the material properties there. So the chromatin retention domain is the main domain that is defining KMT5C's um, behave, dynamic behavior. The orthologs, they are showing similar effects, but you more see like, um, um, you can see that the tighter they bind, the rounder the chromocenter will get. And uh, there is a certain a significant amount of sequence variation in these uh, different orthologs, but uh, probably a conserved physiochemical property. And uh, in the, when we look at the evolutionary clock, we can see that uh, there is uh, a linker that is getting shorter, but we can see a high conservation of these two subdomains. So with this, I will show you our working model. So there is a scaffold of heterochromatin that recruits certain proteins that undergo phase separation there and can probably interact with each other. So Mike will soon tell you a bit more about the heterochromatin core and its properties inside. And with this, I want to thank you for attention and leave you with this nice electron micrograph that is showing in red the KMT5C protein and in green that is like the heterochromatin and you can see that it's restricted to the chromocenters and not going to other parts of chromatin. So thank you for your attention. I'm happy to answer your questions. All right, fantastic. Thank you, Hilmar. I already have, I think we already have a few questions here and I also have uh, one myself. Uh, first question, do proteins other than nuclear bodies like paraspecles, cow bodies also show phase separation properties? Yeah, of course, other as well, you know, you have a phase separation in, uh, in, in the cytoplasm and, uh, you know, it's a, a question in, I think in vitro, if you're changing the, the environmental condition, I think you can probably get a lot of proteins to phase separate. How the situation is in vivo is, uh, is, is a different thing, but of course, there are a lot of proteins that are undergoing uh, phase separation in the cell, it's outside of the nucleus and outside of these nuclear bodies. All right, uh, maybe I'll ask one question here. Uh, what does the KMT5C chromatin retention body uh, domain bind to exactly? Is it kind of like the HP1, PX, BX, L uh, motif that self dimerizes to kind of self recruit itself? And is it also seen in other proteins? So I don't think we have seen this uh, chromatin retention domain uh, in other proteins yet. And it's not really binding to a certain motif. So I think it's uh, a completely novel kind of binding domain that is uh, not really, doesn't really, so we really don't know where it's binding to. And so I hope we can update you in the future on that. All right, uh, we have a question on whether your constructs were overexpressed and if the levels of overexpression matter. That's a very good question. So I don't think it really matters because there were other studies that were doing PrEP experiments with uh, these uh, proteins and also FCS. And so what they have um, seen before us was that when you are completely photobleaching a chromocenter that it takes a long, long time to, uh, to, uh, um, to recover. So I don't think that, and we have looked at different expression levels and we, we couldn't uh, find out, we couldn't correlate this to the kinetic behavior so far. All right, and Matt is asking whether CBX5 plays any role in KMT5C retention. Yes, so there's a, a publication about this, Schotter 2013, so where they say it's uh, necessary there, but we believe that the um, trimethylated H3K9 is more important because we have 
tried to transfer, so we transfected this protein into uh, Zuba 39 uh, cells so that don't have this H3 canine 3 methylation. And so it didn't recruit to, to uh, chroma centers and we didn't see any H4K20 um, um, markup of the histones there at all. That's under the con the context of no HP1 binding to that site, but you have data on HP1 um, interactions with CBX5 or with uh, CAMT5C, right? Exactly. It was also in uh, Uniprod, so that it's, it interacts with uh, HP1. Uh, yeah. But but you have data showing that it changes the behavior when you co-express them, right? Yeah. So it changes uh, the dynamic behavior as we are. So they that. seem to stabilize each other, essentially. Well, the, the CAMT5C is stabilizing the retention of HP1. Is that how you interpret the data? I would say so. Yeah. And this is why I said in this model so that we it's uh, interacting with the scaffold, but also with itself. So it's in a complex interplay of different proteins there. All right, fantastic. And we're just on time here. So unless there is one last question for Hilmar, we'll otherwise go to uh, our next speaker, who is, of course, Dr. Michael Hensel. Uh, Michael Hensel obtained his PhD from the University of Manitoba in 1993. Uh, that was, of course, under the supervision of Dr. James Davey where he trained in chromatin biochemistry. He then worked as a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Calgary, where he continued working on chromatin biology and nuclear organization under the mentorship of Dr. David Bassett Jones. Um, following this incredibly prolific training period, uh, Dr. Hensel then joined the University of Alberta where he currently serves as a professor with a primary appointment in oncology and a adjunct appointment in cell biology at the University of Alberta. Uh, he since published beautiful work on chromatin biology, as you all know, including a very recent paper in Cell on chromatin condensation, which is, I'm sure, what he will talk about uh, right now. So with that, I'll leave it hey, to Michael. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eric. And thank you for the invitation. It's, a, it's an honor to present in this series. Um, I just want to mention before I begin that uh, if people are looking for talented microscopists in chromatin biology, that Tilmar is currently looking for a permanent position. Um, today, I'm going to tell you about this collaborative work with uh, the Alan Underhill's lab and Jeffrey Hansen's laboratory where we looked at the material properties of, of chromatin and chromatin compartments. And what I'm gonna tell you or argue is that the, the morphological appearance of chromatin in cells is dictated largely through a charge neutralization process. And that when you neutralize the amino termini on the, on the core histones, you promote a more dispersed state and then when, um, when those are unacetylated or deacetylated, the nucleosomes stick together. And that this um, pretty straightforward biophysical process is what drives the appearance of chromatin that we see in all different kinds of cell types. And then um, Hilmar introduced to you uh, this work on KMT5C. I think these two pieces of, um, of these two studies go very well together. And um, so there was a lot of work that, had, that uh, Hilmar went through that explained how um, there was a lot of thinking emerging that chromatin is in a liquid state. And, and that's what we're testing here is, is chromatin in a liquid state. And um, so I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about this now. So as you can see, this is emerging theme. So this is a recent review, fluid like chromatin towards understanding the real chromatin organization present in cells. And uh, what they're proposing in, in this model, which is similar to a lot of models that are out right now, is basically you have uh, chromatin loops that are formed. They're formed through this uh, cohesin dependent mechanism where cohesin loads onto the chromatin and then reels itself down until it hits CTCF stop sites. 
and in doing so, it can it forms a ring around the uh, and and creates a loop that is extruded through this ring, and so you get this loop organization, and then um, so these now form indep independent topological associated domains, which can be imaged in high C experiments, and I think you're most of you are familiar with these patterns of interaction and then and then reduced interaction and then high interactions to uh, densities to um, to demarcate the genome into topologically associated domains. And so these domains, um, when you label them up and, and look at them in the microscope, they're actually pretty small, so a couple of hundred nanometers. And so the idea presented in, in this model is that these nucleosomes interact, but they interact in a fluid nature. So the, the individual nucleosomes in here are highly dynamic. They can move around. And, um, and there are kind of two classes of domains, A compartments or B compartments, basically active or inactive, and domains that are similar in type. So inactive domains will tend to associate with each other, or the sequences within them will tend to associate with each other more frequently than they will with with things in A compartments. And as you walk along uh, the genome, you can alternate between A and B compartments. So there's nonlinear relationships in space that are created from these interactions between um, separated uh, A compartment or B compartment type domains. So that's basically um, the model of chromatin. It's uh, a critical component is cohesin is maintaining this into a loop and domain organization. However, um, a couple of papers, well, a few papers came out recently that were very interesting in terms of the role of cohesin and, and how it might be involved in compartmentalizing the genome. And so um, there was a cell line uh, developed a few years ago um, when, and original high c studies done where, where they used an oxin-inducible dagron to get rid of cohesin. And in those experiments, um, what was found was that this high c domain architecture or TAD architecture was disrupted. So you see these patterns in the plus octan side of the graph are lost. And so, so that was previously demonstrated. And the expectation I think was that now we're not gonna see clear domain organization. But when they did fluorescence in situ hybridization, so you see a green probe on one TAD and a magenta probe on another, that they found that in the absence of auxin, so when cohesin is present, you actually saw more overlap than when cohesin was absent. Moreover, cohesin depleted cells, when they go into the next cell cycle, so they can go through cell division, you see they form abnormally shaped nuclei. There, there's definitely issues with them. But the early S phase pattern, which is uh, a pattern of replication that is small punctate and has been um, associated with the replication of single individual TADs, that's still maintained. So you still see this compartmentalization of this early S phase replicated chromatin, even in the absence of, of cohesin. And so this implies that, um, that some of this domain, domain organization that corresponds with CTCF, uh, well, with cohesin mediated boundaries may still be regulated um, um, through the same, uh, through much of the same machinery, but the, the domains seem to be folding independently. So how I, how I imagine this is, is basically you have, um, for example, spacers that have nucleosomes that are highly modified right at, right at these boundary sites that are preventing um, interactions or that are breaking up the folding and enable spacing between the two domains. So um, that's one possible way that that could happen. But the surprising thing is that these domains fold independently of, of cohesin. So I, I wanted to highlight that, you know, th there are changes that occur in high C patterns as you go across um, tissues and through differentiation. But the kinds of changes that you're seeing there are relatively subtle compared to the gross morphological changes you can see between chromatin organization between cells of different cell types. And so this is just a very simple search of um, it's uh, electron microscopy or transmission electron microscopy and cell nucleus in Google. And then this is just the first images that, that pop up. And what you can see is a range of structures and I'm just gonna highlight the two extremes. So this is a lymphocyte and this is a neuron 
this is the lymphocyte is mostly densely packaged chromatin, whereas the um, the neuron you can see hardly any of this, and so these are very extreme differences in organization that um, that are not likely mediated by by subtle changes in in tad organization that correlate with differentiation. Um, so that brings us to the question that we're going to address. And, and I, I guess the, so to reiterate the point that I started with, I think that it's, it's regulating charge interactions between the histones and, um, well, basically the histone DNA binding capability of the amino termini by modulating their charge is regulating the propensity of chromatin to self interact or not. And that that's what's dictating the morphology that we see in, in uh, when we do these thin sections of, of uh, cell nuclei. So there was this emerging data with heterochromatin binding proteins that, um, that chromatin, that condensed chromatin may actually be in a liquid state as well. And we wanted to address that. Um, that idea was really driven home with the publication of, of this paper in cell where they did re use reconstituted chromatin and studied the properties of, of condensed chromatin that they could form in vitro. So what they did in those experiments is they reconstituted nucleosomal arrays. And when they added what they called physiological salt, what happens to uh, chromatin in the presence of physiological salt is it likes to stick to itself. And so they formed these con what they called liquid con or what they call condensates, so these concentrations of chromatin. And if you if you form these in, in solution and you use different labels, so they they labeled histone H4, they have two different fluorophores on here. And then you mix them in solution and you see what happens. What you see is that when when two of these condensed regions of chromatin interact, they fuse to form a larger sphere. And then if you have different colored labels in them, you can see that the labels mix. And um, I guess one thing I should make very clear at this point, when we're distinguishing between liquids and solids, we're not distinguishing between things that move or don't move, although in, in some cases that's the assay. We're distinguishing the thing, between things that mix or don't mix. So it's the mixing that's important. It's not the movement per se. So uh, this is some work that was done in the, the Davy lab that um, I, I want to use to illustrate that we've actually known about phase separation in, in chromatin structure, chromatin biology for uh, about 50 years. Um, when I started uh, my PhD program, a very nice fractionation procedure had been developed in chicken erythrocyte based on this process that enabled um, uh, enrichments up to 50 fold in active genes. And all that you did is basically fragment the chromatin with mycococcal nuclease to get a, a spectrum of sizes. So we're not digesting down to mononucleosomes. We're doing a mild digestion and fragmenting the chromatin. Then uh, you can lyse the nuclei with EDTA that releases the chromatin. And then when you add back salt, so in this case, 150 millimolar sodium chloride, most of the chromatin forms these globs and sticks together and you can sediment that out. And uh, what, what turns out to be important in maintaining this soluble fraction is acetylation. And you can see that particularly with the radio label here, this is the soluble fraction and these are just um, column chromatography fractions separating it by length. You can see that all of these longer fragments have a lot of radio label incorporated into the acetylated histone. And in the Kumasi graph, you also see these are, um, this separates histone according to um, uh, charge. And you can see one, two, three, four acetylation states as separate bands on DH4 here as an example. And you can see that the stuff that's soluble is highly enriched in, in acetylation. So in the past, we interpreted that as solubility and insolubility. But now I think it's pretty clear that, that this uh, was phase separation. And so this is one of the experiments we tried is with endogenous chromatin, we wanted to know if, if we could see the same kind of liquid behavior. And what happened is uh, this just shows uh, that the chromatin becomes less soluble as you increase the magnesium concentration. 
in this case, we're using um, low millimolar concentrations of magnesium. And in most cell lines, you need magnesium to do this in, in the chicken erythrocyte, um, be, presumably because of the special linker histone H5. It will do this in just monovalence, but in most um, cell types, you require uh, a couple of millimolar magnesium chloride to, to see this phenomena. And what happened is that we got these structures, and I'll show you the, the time lapse of this now, um, that didn't fuse. Instead, they formed kind of chains of irregular blobs that, that stuck together. And so this is just, just forming in real time in minutes and seconds after we add the, the magnesium. And you can see that these, these uh, very long blobs of, of chromatin can form. And what they aren't doing is they aren't rounding up uh, which would be one of the indicators that it has liquid properties. So this would suggest that um, that it is solid-like. And then the question is, okay, so this was isolated from cells. There are all kinds of things other than just core histones there. Is this a property that is intrinsic to the chromatin fiber? And so for this, uh, this is uh, all the work that uh, Jeffrey Hansen's lab did. So Jeff is an expert in chromatin reconstitution and salt-dependent folding of chromatin. And so uh, he did uh, reconstituted this um, 12 mer repeat of the uh, Whit Whittem uh, positioning sequence. And then he's mixing these with salts exactly the way that, um, that, that they did in the Rosen lab. And what we find is that in, uh, in the presence of four millimolar magnesium chloride, so he's bleached half of one of these spots now, and you can see there's, there's no redistribution of the fluorescence. When you induce the entire thing or bleach the entire thing again, you see no redistribution of fluorescence. So it's not exchanging with the surrounding material and it's not moving internally. But we could try um, other concentrations. So this is, uh, these are the conditions we used for the endogenous chromatin. And then um, this is just a, a lower concentration of magnesium as well. We're, we're seeing that the lower magnesium is not, um, as long as we have the condensates forming, we're not seeing that the chromatin is exchanging. So why did they get this liquid-like behavior in, his exp in, in the previous experiments? Well, what we found interestingly was that there were three critical components to this. And that was um, magnesium acetate. So the acetate counter ion is important, although it's, it's a more minor, minor uh, component. But the, the really important components were the DTT and BSA. And so you can see that um, if, you, if you just have uh, acetate ions, you don't really get much exchange. There's a little bit of signal here, but it's, it's negligible. Once you have the DTT and BSA added to that, now you start getting this liquid nature. Uh, if you remove the DTT, you don't see that as well. There's a little bit of, of mixing and that tells you that the reduction of BSA is actually one of the important parameters in this. And so that is creating the liquidity uh, presumably by uh, competing with, uh, with histones for interactions with DNA or, or, um, or some other mechanism. So, uh, so what we found was that that liquid-like behavior was re required specific conditions and the typical conditions in vitro uh, or the classical conditions that have been used for this uh, chromatin fractionation uh, procedure in vitro uh, resulted in the formation of solid-like chromatin um, condensate. So they don't exchange and they don't move around internally. So the conclusion is that the solid-like properties are intrinsic to the histone DNA complex itself and that these arrays are self-interacting biopolymers that reversibly cross-link into hydrogels in magnesium, millimolar magnesium solutions near physiological pH. So what is the material state of chromatin in living cells. So there's, I think there's um, very, at least reasonably good evidence that a lot of these liquid condensates inside cells do behave as expected of liquid condensates. So in other words, I, th I think that they're accurately described as such. 
And certainly that seemed to be the case with heterochromatin and Hilmar just showed you a striking example of a heterochromatin protein that clearly was liquid, meaning that it could mix inside there. So the photo bleached and the unbleached components would mix. If we had two different colors in there, you would see the same thing, they would mix. But it doesn't exchange with the surrounding nucleoplasm or exchanges very poorly. So um, that's the first example of, of a protein uh, in the nucleus that's liquid-like in nature and is that robustly compartmentalized. And uh, in the absence of a membrane barrier, it implies a very interesting mechanism. But, and some other things that you saw from, from Hilmar's and Ellen's work is that uh, the, the sphericity was often influenced by the KMT5C expression. So again, that's suggesting because um, uh, in a liquid, liquid unmixed state, it will try and minimize surface area, the, the compartment that forms. And so roundness is, uh, to some extent, uh, can reflect liquidity. So we use these uh, mouse fibroblast uh, model to, to study this. The reason for this is that it has, if you remember uh, the picture I showed you at the start of this um, variety of chromatin structures you could see inside cells, uh, these cells have a lot of different types of chromatin. So you have these chromocenters that are very distinct. So this is electron micrograph. These are the, this is a fluorescence micrograph. But then you have all of this other kind of condensed material that you can see in fluorescence microscopy and in electron microscopy, you see um, scattered all of these little condensed regions. There's just higher magnification in electron microscopy. So the chromatin is yellow there. And uh, this is just, very high magnification uh, to illustrate what you're actually seeing in these condensed structures. So, so a line like this is actually a, a 10 nanometer fiber. You can see a couple of them here. And what this looks like is that you essentially took some, you essentially got a bowl of spaghetti. You have a lot of, of individual 10 nanometer fibers that are interacting with each other, but there's no well-defined um, mechanism of interaction. Uh, it's been reported in, and uh, we can see in these micrographs too, sometimes you can get uh, two 10 nanometer fibers running in parallel for certain stretches, but as a whole, these, these interactions don't appear to be well-defined, but, but the, the chromatin fibers are kind of um, well mixed with each other and interacting frequently, I guess is, is maybe how I would uh, say that. So to study the, whether or not this was liquid or solid in cells, one of the things that, you know, um, people, we did fluorescence recovery after photo bleaching experiments on histone H2B in uh, 2000. And, uh, you know, to some extent, you could reach these conclusions based on, on those experiments. But a limitation of those experiments, and particularly um, with, single particle tracking data on nucleosomes where histones were labeled, suggesting that, that there was considerable liquidity inside the chromatin. Um, a disadvantage of those is that the histone can be uncoupled from the DNA. And so what we wanted to do is label the DNA so it was unambiguous if we got any kind of movement that it had to be, uh, you know, um, with the exception of something that was completely broken and, and diffusing, but we're controlling for that it would have to be um, the DNA, the chromatin that was moving. It, it, it couldn't be explained by dissociation of the histone, for example. And so we did these experiments. And um, so uh, I guess the other thing I wanted to point out about this is depending on where you are in S phase, you get different labeling patterns. So you can selectively label euchromatin early in S phase, and then at later stages, you can label the heterochromatin. So, we do a, a scratch labeling uh, where the basically a needle is used to to temporarily um, um, permeabilize cell membranes in the presence of a fluorescent nucleotide. That nucleotide gets into the cell and incorporated into the chromatin, and you get labeling patterns. And um, and then we so we basically grow these um, for uh, uh, overnight, and then do the experiment the next day. 
And what you're looking at here is, so the yellow is the replication label, uh, so down here, and then it, we also have a uh, hook stain and we photo bleach part of the labeled chromatin. And what you can see is over a 30 minute time period, this label does not really invade the interior of that region that was, uh, that was photo bleached, which is very unlike what happened with the KMT5C as I'll show you in a minute. And unlike what, what was reported for um, even more liquid like structures. So for the early S phase chromatin, um, we, we weren't doing experiments with the resolution to determine whether or not inside these individual replication foci or TADs, uh, whether or not we have liquidity. But what we could do is look at whether or not there was, um, there was evidence of, of mixing. And what we found again with, with the euchromatin is that we don't see invasion of the label into the photo bleached region. I'll, I'll skip over that movie. I don't, I don't think it'll, well, Maybe I'll just show you one thing. So again, I want to I want to emphasize that we're not talking about an absence of movement. We're talking about an absence of mixing. And so if if you just watch the first um, sorry couple of seconds of this, you see these things jiggle around. There's plenty of movement. A lot of this, or at least some of this movement, is mediated by external forces. But these things are constrained in their motion and motion itself is not the criterion for whether or not it's liquid or solid. It is whether you get mixing of molecules. So just keep that in mind when we're talking about this, because I don't want you to confuse and uh, confuse this and, and think that I think that, that the chromatin inside the cell is a rigid rock and doesn't move. Um, that's, not, that's not what I believe. So can this coexist with liquid-liquid phase separation of heterochromatin proteins? Essentially, this was, um, uh, I'm just going to skip over that. Hilmar introduced this to you in KMT5C. He showed you could get trapped inside chromocenters, but it uh, it could move within, so it was liquid. It could mix. So in part, this was a, a control experiment. What we were asking is whether labeling with DUTP was responsible for the solid-like behavior, and so. We wanted to see if the KMT5C could recover under conditions um, that the, the DNA did not. And that's exactly um, what you'll see here. So you photo bleach this, the KMT5C is gonna slowly recover, but the DNA does not move into that. So that means two things. One, it means that the slow movement of KMT5C is not explained by something that is stably bound to the DNA and the DNA is slowly moving. And it says that the labeling with the DUTP likely didn't change the properties of the chromatin um, in that we can still see this liquid-like behavior to the KMT5C without seeing the movement of the chromatin. Um, so this tells us that solid-like behavior of chromatin is observed in living cells and that compartmentalization of KMT5C into an associated liquid-like heterochromatin department is maintained in replication labeled heterochromatin. So can we create liquid states in chromatin? And so if we go back to this chromatin um, fractionation data, our expectation was that, that we could disperse the chromatin by treating them with histone deacetylase inhibitors and that this would show some evidence of liquidity. And, um, this is this was uh, data also consistent with what was published in the Rosen lab. So what they showed was that if they uh, put a TET binding site in this array and then fused P300 hat domain to it and add acetyl-CoA, they could dissolve these domains, they would disperse. And they also showed evidence by injecting these arrays into cells that the acetylated chromatin would mix well with the nucleoplasm. And in fact, uh, you can see an earlier iteration of our paper before we had done these live cell experiments. And we were basing a lot of this on the electron microscopy. We basically concluded uh, that too. We, we thought that we had a charge dependent phase transition where the chromatin went from a liquid soluble state with acetylation to a, uh, a solid uh, condensed state. So, we can completely disperse most of the interphase chromatin with histone deacetylase inhibitors. So this is um, electron micrograph 
of uh, a cell in the absence of TSA and so the chromatin, these are these kind of interface chromatin condensates that we see. When we put in TSA, it's all dispersed down into a particulate nature with a couple of exceptions. The chromocenters in mouse are retained and there's a little bit of lamina associated chromatin. Um, that's illustrated again here, but the, the point is that um, these conditions were sufficient at the electron microscopy level to fully disperse these chromatin condensates. And so we were expecting to see liquid-like behavior, not necessarily in the heterochromatin, and, and we didn't in the heterochromatin, but we did expect to see maybe some evidence for that in the TSA-treated cells, um, but we don't. And it's also striking that despite blowing apart this apparent structure in the transmission electron microscope, when we look at the early S phase labeled cells, we still have these same replication compartments that um, have been correlated with individual TADs. So this implies that even though we've blown apart these, these um, most of these uh, nucleosome, nucleosome interactions that are holding fibers together, uh, there is still organization that's being retained. And um, I can speculate about why that is. Um, you probably have good ideas as to why that might be too, but, but that was somewhat a surprise given the, the total disruption of order that we could see in, the, in a thin section of a transmission electron microscope. So the second thing we did was uh, DNA damage. So we had shown, Hilmar had shown previously that uh, with laser micro radiation associated DNA damage, you get a lot of parallation, which is adding a lot of negative charge to the histones and should work in the same, same way and blow apart this chromatin. And so what you can see here is that this is a, a heterochromatin region, a chromocenter. He does uh, the damage on this half of, of the chromatin and all you really see is that, um, that um, well, you, what you don't see is mixing between these, these two surfaces. So you don't see any invasion of, of these regions just outside of the damaged DNA with the damaged DNA. And I think kind of more strikingly, when you damage in euchromatic regions, what you see is isometric expansion, as if what you're doing is adding water to a gel. And I have a video of that, that that's a little bit more compelling. So um, there is one particular domain in here. It's probably hard to see that gets dissociated, so completely blown up. And what you see with the rest of this is it just swells up and pushes everything out of the way as if it's just expanding. So um, let me run that again. So the cellular chromatin does not mix even when in a dispersed state and that chromatin domains can be disassembled by laser induced DNA damage and parlation or deacetylase inhibitor treatment. But the chromatin still remains solid-like, so it doesn't mix. And uh, so to summarize uh, this part, I'm not sure, um, could you tell me how much time I have left, Eric? A couple of minutes. Okay. Um, there are some interesting movies uh, that, I, that I can show at the end to illustrate other features of chromatin to drive home some messages, but I don't have to. So, so the summary of this basically was, is that in vitro, um, the chromatin, when we did photo bleaching, we saw that it didn't really move around. So that means that it's not in a liquid state. It was also irregular in shape. The chromatin reconstituted in vitro under most conditions also behaved as a solid. It, the chromatin doesn't move around in these condensates. But we could get this happening under conditions where BSA and DTT are present. This was true also, this is true of both euchromatin and heterochromatin. And so again, I got this note up here, mobility is not liquidity. And I wanna make sure nobody loses track of that, that point. So we're not talking about the chromatin domains not being able to move, they do. But within these domains, the chromatin is not mixing. And uh, oh, there we go. And so our overall model for chromatin structure is that um, charge is mediating whether or not the chromatin is going to associate with itself and form visible condensates. And um, acetylation is a major way of regulating this charge, but not the only one. Um, 
things I'm not really going to talk about here, but that's related to the ability of the chromatin to withstand force. But importantly, what I do think is relevant here is that, um, so what we think happens is that the chromatin is exiting mitosis in a dense state. And it has, in the case of this uh, pericentric heterochromatin, it's decorated with, for example, lysine-9 methylation. We think that that existing initial concentration of the modification is what concentrates these heterochromatin proteins that are capable of liquid-liquid phase separation above a critical threshold and that they form a, uh, a semi-permeable barrier that is capable of filtering molecules. And, and so in the case of KMT5C, it gets trapped inside. And in the case of other things, we think they might be excluded. And um, so uh, I won't go through this in much detail. Uh, that's basically the, the talk. So things we're working on now, um, what explains differences in, in chromatin accessibility. So there was, we have some evidence in KMT5C of some sort of energy barrier to exit. And um, there's, uh, there's a different model of this heterochromatin where what you have is in a poor solvent, a, a polymer is gonna collapse. And when it, when it collapses, it, it will create a, it'll be more dense, it's gonna be concentrated in, and it uh, might create a percolation space, which is gonna exclude a, a, some of the volumes occupied by chromatin. So you expect some exclusion, but the point of, of of this paper is that things actually diffuse through there freely. And we don't really think that's the case. So when we're looking at things like green fluorescent protein and exclusion from, in this case, a chromocenter, what we find is that the depletion levels can be up to 80 or 90%, and um, which is greater than what, what, what we think we should expect. So in mitotic chromosomes, the maximum chromatin density is around 50%. Of, of the volume occupied by chromatin. And so we're trying uh, other things than proteins. And one of the things that we've tried is these small molecular weight cell tracking dyes, which are less than a kilodalton in size. And this just illustrates two of them uh, that are very similar in size. This one's actually a little bit bigger. And so the calcium AM, this is a chromocenter here in the center, it gets depleted around 30%, which is around the estimate of the the volume that is occupied by chromatin in, in those uh, chromocenters. So that is actually about what we expect if, if, a, if a molecule is freely diffusing across here. However, this cell tracker orange is depleted between 80 and 90%. You can see that kind of very clearly in, in a prophase cell. And that is beyond what is expected based on a size exclusion model. So we think that size may not, may not um, be the mechanism of exclusion from, from structures like this, and that there actually is some sort of phase boundary there that is providing some selectivity, but that's something we're further testing. Um, just to illustrate an example of uh, a period where I think chromatin might become liquid, this is gonna just show a bunch of cells undergoing apoptosis, which you're gonna, if you just pay attention when the apoptosis starts, like it's starting now, you see these very rapid transitions to these, more spherical domains that uh, that may fuse together and show some liquid-like behavior. So I think upon um, degradation of the of some of the uh, some of the DNA during apoptosis that the chromatin is being liquefied, but that's something we need to check. And then the very last thing is um, chromatin has elastic behavior, and this is just an extreme example of a force being applied by the cytoplasm. And all I want to illustrate to you is that when the force is removed, the chromatin kind of springs back into shape. And so I'll end it there and just uh, acknowledge the people. So um, I particularly want to acknowledge Darren McDonald. He was a technician in my laboratory for 20 years. He unfortunately um, uh, came up with uh, uh, leukemia during uh, the first lockdown period and passed away. And so um, he was a major contributor to my lab and we dedicated this paper to him when we published it. And I just want to acknowledge that um, Crystal Mission and, and Stanley Poon uh, contributed technically. Kilmar did most of the work. Uh, Tom Talsma did uh, in vitro reconstitution work and Ajit Sharma also did uh, our in vitro work. 
and then also thank Ellen Underhill and Jeffrey Hansen. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you, Michael. Uh, really sorry to hear about Darren. Um, the uh, work is, is actually really super interesting and I'm sure there's gonna be uh, quite a few questions on here. So again, uh, we'll gladly take uh, questions from the audience. Uh, you can type them out into the uh, chat function. Maybe I can start with a bit of a naive question. Um, yeah. Because I don't really work with uh, phase separation, but uh, while a solid light compartment is still dynamic and still does move, is the movement slower and measurably slower than in a liquid light compartment? And I'm thinking of the analogy of a glacier where uh, if you look at it in a fast track uh, time lapse, it does move, right? And maybe there's also less intermixing than, say, water. Right, so um, one of the issues, chromatin motion is kind of complicated and um, maybe I'll add a couple of my thoughts here on, on chromatin motion. So when you deplete ATP, you don't see much chromatin motion, it stops. And, um, but the other thing that happens is the chromatin condenses. And, and one of the reasons that might be, and so the complication in interpreting that experiment is that um, the ATP depletion, because ATP is chelating magnesium and magnesium is, is um, in the cell and magnesium is condensing chromatin, you might be locally, or you might be releasing more magnesium and that's been shown to occur locally during chromosome condensation during the Mishima lab. So, um, in the case of cellular ATP depletion, you might be doing that globally, but it it does. Um, so you have localized diffusional movement where things are constrained, and then you have a more global movement, um, which actually I can oh my, I could I can illustrate here. Uh, you have a more global movement, which is being mediated by um, by uh, external kinds of forces. So I can, so basically what you, what you can see, uh, sorry, in this as, as you move back and forth and I'm doing it fast is that there's there's things moving as blocks and, and what's happening is the whole surface of, there's, there's um, the nucleus itself, the surface is rotating and it's moving things around, but there's coordination of motion on these longer time scales, which basically tells you that all these chromosomes are kind of being held together, whether they're, they're um, fully condensed or decondensed. I guess what I think about motion, what's occurring is I kind of look at it as, as there's an, it's like a net, you can tighten that net and you're gonna, and the individual nodes um, will not be able to move very much. But, but when this net is in a relatively relaxed state, you know the the nodes where the ropes come together. If you know if you had that in water, or whatever, you could you could have motion without disrupting the fact that it's still a net. It's connected. It, it's a solid structure. I don't know if that was. Um, yeah, no, it's super interesting. It's uh, definitely complex. Uh, so I, I guess maybe I, I want to make one more point about about liquidity and single particle tracking. So uh, I I think um, it's it seems kind of obvious, although these cohesin experiments maybe suggest it's a little less obvious that chromatin has to mix to form a long range interaction enhancer promoter interaction, you have to have local rearrangement of chromatin, one presume. And I had assumed that that was happening in, in a passive basis. But one of the challenges in interpreting the single molecule tracking data is that you have this global motion and these whole domains are moving. And the, well, the experiments are attempt to control for that, it's not completely convincing to me that when people are showing single nucleosome movement that it's not really actually whole domain movement. All right, and uh, we're at the one o'clock mark. 
Uh, so if you and Hilmar don't mind sticking around, maybe we can answer some of the last questions. Sure. And for those who cannot stick around, I'll just remind you that our next speaker is going to be Dr. Annie Sierna, and that seminar will take place on March 19th. So thanks, everyone. Uh, if you can't stick around, we have a few more questions here. So other than acetylation, is there anything known of other histone modifications and phase separation or liquid-like properties? Um, yeah, I mean, there's plenty. So the, you know, CBX2 um, interaction with trimethyl K27 is, um, and CBX, uh, so the, the PRC1 complex can phase separate in solution and, um, and then can incorporate nucleosomes that contain K27 methylation. And um, so there's, um, those methylations in, in this case, um, I mean, so the, that lysine 9 methylation is not important for maintaining uh, chromocenters, but it is important for recruiting proteins like HP1 in there. So the phase separation that's been reported, if it's occurring at a chromocenter, um, that's likely dependent on, on um, the, the modification state. Alan has some data indicating that DNA methylation and, and that lysine 9 methylation, or at least the KMT5C, which is dependent on that lysine 9 methylation, might, might have a competitive interaction. Um, and in terms of poly ADP ribosylation, so the, or the initial um, experiments in the cell nucleus that provided uh, some of the first evidence for phase separation taking place were actually laser micro irradiation experiments where they showed that poly ADP ribosylation, which is happening on the histones as well as the PARP itself, that that formed a phase separated environment. This polymer formed a phase separated environment that um, through bringing in a lot of uh, intrinsically disordered proteins that then um, supported this multivalent network of interactions. Um, so yes, and, and probably there's going to be more uh, ubiquitylation may be important in this. So ubiquitin and ubiquitin binding proteins, it's easy to see how that could initiate phase separation. And it's actually something that, that we're interested in in the context of DNA damage repair, because we uh, find some evidence that there's kind of a bipartite compartment forming with the ubiquitin concentrated in the middle. We think that that may be happening through that kind of mechanism. And that's those are modifications that are happening on histones. All right. We have a question from Jim asking on transcription factories and whether these two things are a separation distinct from compartment A in general. So um, I guess I was I was uh, just reading um, something yesterday about the clustering of these molecules and uh, whether or not some of this could be explained by clustering and binding. I guess one of the things to, to keep in mind here in terms of what we're talking about, uh, when we have visible structures in, in a light microscope, we have you know at least tens of copies of molecules, particularly if we're looking with um, with conventional um, microscopy methods. So they can accumulate there because they're bound to something that is more stable locally, so it's not moving around, which could be chromatin, for example, and that their binding sites are, are present at high enough spatial density for them to accumulate as a visible structure. They can also accumulate potentially through these phase um, separation mechanisms. So for example, um, you know, the RNA polymerase II, uh, uh, super elongation complex components, uh, BRD4, all of these things associated with um, euchromatic um, structures and, and transcription have been, uh, there's evidence that they phase separate. And I guess, um, so the question is whether that's actually phase separation or that's just loading onto, for example, an individual pad. 
And um, I think with BRD4, there are structures that it forms normally, and you can see with antibodies, you don't have to express proteins to do it, that are larger than, um, than euchromatic domains that would suggest they're independent. We did a lot of experiments quite some time ago um, when I was uh, earlier on, when I was, uh, well, Kirk McManus did when he was a graduate student in my lab about 15 years ago, where we tried to co-localize things like uh, CBP with, with the acetylated chromatin and things like that. And what we tended to find, and um, I, I have some comments in an old review where I even describe what was liquid-like behavior in live cells of, of this material, is we tended to find that they had an independent existence that had a spatial relationship with chromatin, so it tended to be proximal, but it wasn't superimposed. So I guess my thinking for over 20 years is that um, a lot of these transcription factors are collecting into structures that, are, that have an existence independent of chromatin. So I think this is happening. But um, yeah, in, in the end, what we're really, we know that there's a structure there, so there's one of two things happening. Either the chromatin is sufficiently um, compact and the binding sites are sufficiently concentrated to, uh, to form these structures, or these structures are forming and then associating with the surface of chromatin. And of the data that I've personally been involved in, I favor the latter hypothesis, which is consistent with some of the things, for example, that Richard Young Lab has been promoting. All right, so we still have a few uh, questions to go through, if you don't mind. No, I, I have uh, time. Let me to, uh, to run. <laughs> yeah, I have, uh, I have another hour, that's fine, Lecky. I don't think everybody else does, but I'm happy to talk about this. <laughs> All right, so uh, Jeff is asking about conditions where a, um, where a coordination of gene activation would take place, like uh, using estrogen or retinoic acid, and would this lead to mixing of genes that are estrogen responsive? Well, um, the, I guess what I expect to see, based on the the kinds of models that uh, I was out um, that we we're talking about, for example, like Richard Young has been promoting, is that what you would see is that you have a a separate domain that the individual genes are making contact with, and you know over the course of the whole genome, that's not going to be a single site. There's going to be maybe hundreds of sites that have more than one gene associated with them. And that, that that is happening through um, this limited motion that's taking place and then association with these domains that happen uh, or um, when, they, when they collide. And those, um, these liquid-like domains that form from transcription factors, if, if they in, in fact do form, have, I think, greater mobility, at least the, the experiments that I've done myself, have greater mobility than the chromatin. And so th these things can potentially um, bounce around a bit and then s stick to chromatin and uh, as it, uh, and, and that's how I imagine it happening is that it's, um, that they are associating with the surface, but they're not really mixing. Um, but uh, these are experiments that we still have to do. My own, um, uh, suspicion about why we see the maintenance of these structures when we've blasted apart the chromatin is that that's cohesin dependent. And if we take out cohesin, that all of a sudden uh, the chromatin is in the presence of uh, charge neutralization like HDAC inhibitors, it will become completely liquid. All right, we have a question from Nicole. Uh, so she's asking about the in vitro assay with DTT and reused uh, PSA. Uh, mm -hmm. in the liquid, liquidifying of chromatin uh, and whether this could be a property that might be present in some chromatin proteins that could be used to locally liquidify uh, chromatin. Okay, um, so I, I guess that's the, the remarkable thing is the experiments with parallelation. If anything is going to liquefy chromatin, that the DNA damage should have done it. 
And so I'm surprised at the way the chromatin behaves after DNA damage. That said, um, you know, we, we don't know about the diffusion within a, what would amount to a euchromatin, uh, like a TAD that's euchromatic because th that's below our resolution of our current experiments. There is some evidence that um, from single nucleosome tracking experiments that, that they may be liquid. And so what I would expect is if that's the case is that that's mediated by acetylation and that um, as, as one of the main players, I mean, there will be other, other things that, uh, that could, um, that, that can potentially influence the charge or the interactions of the histone tails with adjacent nucleosomes, et cetera, uh, that could liquefy it. But um, I guess I suspect yes, but um, the failure to, to see it has me wondering if even, um, you know, relatively infrequent crosslinks so in other words, nucleosome, uh, nucleosome interactions between distant regions of fibers are sufficient to maintain this in, as a network or you know, kind of essentially a, a cross-linked gel with just lower cross-linking efficiency uh, and that we will never actually see true liquidity. Um, so I'm not sure, I, I expect it to happen, but so far observations are, are um, are going against my intuition. All right, and we have two other questions here. So Tanzim is asking if you could comment more on the mechanism of expansion of chromatin after IR-induced DNA damage. Yeah, so um, one of the things that's happening is that you're adding polymer, negatively charged polymers. And, um, that disrupts the charge, should disrupt the charge balance. And this has been shown by Guy Poyer's lab um, many years ago in vitro that when you parlay chromatin, it unfolds it's, and, and becomes fully extended. It doesn't like to, the nucleosomes don't stick together. So what I think is happening is that you had nucleosomes that were sticking together. Um, and I wonder if, so, um, uh, maybe I can, you know, basically you, you have things that are sticking together a lot. And then what happens is those interactions are reduced. There's water that comes in. Essentially the chromatin fiber now is um, more able to interact with the solution as opposed to uh, strongly interacting with itself. And so it disperses out, but you still have interactions between chromatin fibers that are occurring, but at a much lower frequency. So that allows you to expand a gel, essentially. Um, I don't, one of the things that I was doing a lot uh, while these experiments were taking place is my daughter was playing with these things called orbies, which are small they come as very tiny little beads and you put them in water and they swell up massively. And, and that's just from the gel becoming hydrated and binding more water. And, uh, and so that it, you know, it has cross links, but uh, um, those cross links don't become um, limiting until you add a lot of water. So essentially it's like a, a relaxed gel when it's collapsed and then you add water and you swell it until, um, until you exceed its, or until you reach its capacity to expand. And that's what I think might be going on with the chromatin is that it's, it's swelling like a gel um, and, and that it is essentially a gel. All right, so last question. This obviously generated a lot of interest. Uh, do you think that the observed exclusion plays an important role in preventing positive regulators like HATS from accessing heterochromatin compartments and in turn its integrity? Yeah, so um, I guess if you, if you look at this, if you actually go in and um, look at this bioarchive paper, the original version of this paper, that was part of that paper. And we actually had, um, CBP or P300 in there as part of those experiments. So that's what I suspect, but what we have to discriminate between is um, we have to discriminate uh, 
I lost my train of thought here. Um, we, uh, sorry, could you ask the question again for, uh, yeah, I, I lost whether myself. Whether these compartments are excluding uh, oh. regulators. Right, so, so what we have to distinguish is size-based exclusion. And my understanding of, of chromatin-mediated repression and how people think about it is it's always based on a steric mechanism where you have size-based exclusion. And what we're trying to test right now, so why we use something like GFP is because it's pretty small, but um, CBP is also excluded. We have, uh, with a fluorescent tag on that, it's also excluded from the chromo centers. And so we started to move to, what I wanted to do is basically get a range of these dyes that varied a bit in their chemistry, see which ones got in and which ones didn't, and see if we could infer anything about that, uh, anything from that about the mechanism, about a mechanism other than size that might be modulating it. But um, so yes, I, uh, my hypothesis is that, uh, that these phase boundaries are important in regulatory fidelity and, and that the mechanism is not steric hindrance, that that's not how chromatin is being regulated. It's being regulated by, I mean, a, apart from the obvious steric hindrance of nucleosomes positioned on specific sequences. But I mean, the chromatin folding itself, so the difference between DNA one sensitive and insensitive chromatin is not reflecting steric hindrance. Um, that's, uh, um, yeah, that's my thinking exactly. All right, we've gone through the, uh, the questions. Thank you so much for uh, sticking around and uh, answering uh, everyone's, uh, everyone's qu comments, questions here. And thanks for everyone who uh, also stayed around to, uh, to listen. Yes, thank you very much, everybody. I, I appreciate you sticking sure. around and asking questions as well. And thank you for your attention. This was a, a real pleasure to get the opportunity to speak to this group.